today's host for our session. So today we have here with us Dr. Michael Davis. He is the professor and chairman of Melanoma Medical Oncology at the MD Anderson Cancer Center located in the Texas Medical Center. So before we begin, I would just like to encourage you all to turn on your cameras if you feel comfortable doing so. And throughout the presentation, you are free to ask questions either in the chat or you can unmute your mic. Um, if the questions that are in the chat, I will be reading out at the end of his presentation um, so that he can answer them whenever he is done with his presentation. And also, if you have any questions, you can type them um, in the chat, either like about, um, like if there's a technical difficulty or about the session, um, you can direct message me in the chat if that's needed. Um, but yeah, without further ado, Dr. Davis, you can take it away. Very good. Well, thank you so much. And it's great to see so many of you here on a Sunday afternoon. It looks like it's been a uh, a really nice conference over the weekend, and I hope to close this out with a presentation that you'll find interesting. Let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, let's see, go into presentation mode. Are you, uh, are we, you're seeing the, the preview of the next slide or, yep, okay, let me just swap it really quick. Very good. And then just to avoid any distraction, I'm just going to stop my video just during the presentation. But um, I'm sorry? You had to know you. I'm sorry? You had to invite one of you. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Let me switch it back then. Okay, yeah. so it looks okay? Yeah. Okay, very good. Well, listen, thank you again very much for the invitation to talk today. I, I have to tell you, so again, it's one of the things I can remember um, being at the point of starting to think about applying for medical school, to be honest, it was one of those things I was trying to think about applying to medical school or applying for graduate school. Um, and then as we'll talk about, eventually decided to apply for MD-PhD programs instead. Um, it's one of the things that was probably the most important decision I made in my career in terms of the, the type of work that I've been doing for the last 20 years or so. But I have to say the other personal tie to this is that I have um, two daughters who are very interested in going into medicine, one of whom is in college, one of whom is in high school. And so certainly hope that I can do anything I can to help you guys to get the information that you need. So with that, why don't I go ahead and get started? Um, just very briefly, uh, as a researcher, we always sort of show at the beginning our disclosures, even when it's not really that relevant to the talk that we're giving. But just to know, because of the work that I do in the laboratory, I actually work with many different companies because we're trying to do research on how to make existing treatments work better. And so I work with many different types of companies, but none of this should really impact the presentation that I'm giving today. And so what I wanna to do today is to really talk to you again about the MD-PhD training program and the physician scientist career pathway, sort of using myself as an example. So first, We'll talk about MD-PhD training and the physician scientist career path and what are some of the reasons people go into this, what are some of the important things to think about as you consider it. Um, we'll talk about my own personal experience as a physician scientist. And then I also wanted to have a chance to talk to you about medical oncology, which is what I do clinically. Um, even for those of you who aren't interested in a physician scientist career, for those of you who are thinking about medical oncology for the future, wanted to sort of relate to you sort of how exciting the progress is that we're making uh, in, in this new uh, field uh, as a way to hopefully try to generate enthusiasm for going into this as a career. And then finally, closing with some bit of advice and then hopefully some questions. So with that, let's start out talking about MD-PhD training and physician scientist careers. So I think as you guys have been talking about the last couple of days, I think hopefully everybody has a really good understanding about medical school training, it's four years of training, traditionally two years that are primarily classroom based, and then two years that are primarily clinically based. And certainly more and more programs now starting to integrate clinical experiences into those first two years. And historically, PhD programs for people who really just wanna focus on research 
are really immersive laboratory training programs that can go anywhere from six to eight years. And so what is an MD-PhD program? And so an MD-PhD program has to have those same four years of medical training, but we then integrate into that program three, maybe four years, really focused on laboratory research to meet the requirements of the PhD program. One of the things that's special about MD-PhD programs is that they generally um, have come with free tuition and actually a small stipend to actually support cost of living for MD-PhD trainees as they go through this process. And the ultimate goal of all of this is that MD-PhD training programs were really set up to develop physician scientists who would primarily stay on in academia. And at the end of all of your training, one of the things that really sometimes pushes people from staying in academia to going into private practice is having really high amounts of debt. And so the idea of providing the free tuition and stipend is to try to minimize that burden in people who go through this training program. So that really isn't the pressure on people once they can finish the program and are trying to decide whether to stay in academics or to go into private practice. And really, um, as far as the training program goes, there's actually many different approaches that are used for how these training uh, parts, how these parts of your training are really integrated. And so just as an example, this is the MD-PhD program curriculum at the University of Texas at Houston Medical School, which is where I graduated from and where I participate in candidate interviews. And so the way that the curriculum is set up at, at UT Houston is that students go through the first three years of medical school. In the summers before the first year of medical school and before the second year of medical school, those summers are used to do rotations in different laboratories to gain research experience and potentially to identify a mentor that you will do your PhD work with. And then most students go on to do the full third year of medical school. And then at the end of the third year of medical school, Instead of going into the fourth year, now students transition into their research part of their training program. And again, this says 3.8 years on average. I've seen people complete their research in as short as two years. One person completed it in as short as one year who'd already been working with their mentor before they entered the program as long as four years as well. And so we do our PhD work, we defend our dissertation, and then you go into the fourth year of medical school. And during that period of time, we'll interview for your residency training or for postdoctoral training for people who decide not to pursue additional um, clinical work. Um, there are different models for this out there. There's a very traditional model in which people do the first two years of medical school and then go into the laboratory and then come back for the third and fourth year of medical school. Personally, I like the way that the UT Houston program did it because the reality is, is, is that the way that you really understand disease is by taking care of patients. And so having completed the third year of medical school, you then go into the laboratory with a really good understanding of what disease is. And I think that's different than just reading about it in a textbook. It also allows you in this sort of setup to be able to go through third year medical school, which is one of the most challenging years with your classmates. Um, which I found to, again, be very helpful in terms of the type of support system you need going through that year. But, but again, I have many friends who've gone through different uh, variations and different iterations of this, all of whom have gone on to do quite well. Um, and so for people who go through the MD-PhD training, there clearly is a next step that you go through, really sort of dependent on what type of career you want to have. There are some people who complete their MD-PhD training and realize at the end of it, what they really want to do is just take care of patients. And so those people will go on to do clinical residencies and then maybe even fellowships if they want to specialize. Sometimes we have people who go through the training and come through at the end and realize what they really love doing is working in the lab and doing research and not really being involved in patient care. And for those individuals, they generally go on to postdoctoral fellowships just focused on research. There are some careers that actually really facilitate this, such as Actually, pathology is a career where you don't actually interact with live patients, but you're reviewing pathology material. So still a physician, but really much more sort of uh, able to facilitate um, laboratory research. 
Now, again, I'm an example of a person who came through the training and came out with continued interest in both seeing patients and doing research. And so I went on to do a residency program uh, in internal medicine, followed by my fellowship in hematology oncology. And traditionally, when you go down the path, at least of internal medicine, and followed by a specialty fellowship, that's usually a total of six years, traditionally three years in each program. Um, but for people who come through as physician scientists in particular, who know that they really want to maximize the amount of time that they'll get for training in the laboratory, there is also a pathway called short tracking. And here you still do the same total of six years of training, but what they do is, is you cut down the residency training to two years and you add an extra year onto your fellowship. So fellowship is four years with the idea that you're now getting to spend an extra year in the area that you're really gonna focus on and generally have an extra year protected for research. And so that's sort of the sort of general ways that we go through the, um, the training after we complete our medical school or after you complete MD, PhD training. For those of you who are interested in pursuing MD, PhD training, let's talk a little bit just about MD, PhD applications. And so in general, people apply for this in parallel to your applications to medical school. It's actually sort of a requirement for MD, PhD programs that you can get into the medical school first. Um, but there are some places where you can apply to MD, PhD programs after you've been enrolled in the medical school. We've seen this sometimes with people who've enrolled in medical school and then spent a summer working doing research and, and found that they really loved doing research and then applied for the MD PhD program at that point. But in general, it's really done as your initial applications to medical school. And so how is the application different or the selection criteria? And so again, I do spend time reviewing applicants for, med for MD PhD programs and for interviewing candidates. And so some components of the review process are very similar to what we do for applicants for medical school we will look at your academic record. What was your major? What classes did you take? Um, what was your grade point average, particularly in the classes that count towards medical school and what were the MCAT scores? I think in terms of clinical exposure here, the main idea is not so much that you've really come out of your undergraduate experience having expertise in clinical medicine, but simply that you've had a chance to really work in a clinical setting and make sure that that's something that you feel comfortable with and want to do. For MD-PhD programs, what becomes really important is demonstration of research experience. And in particular, not only saying you worked in a lab and you did a bunch of projects, but can you in your application demonstrate an understanding of your project? And one of the ways that I find people can communicate that most effectively is talking about not only what went well in a project, but what was a problem you ran into? What was a barrier that you had to overcome or solve and how did you do it? It's a really good way to sort of demonstrate that you really were intellectually invested in your project and involved in your project, which is really sort of, again, the, the best and strongest criteria that we have for trying to understand who will really do well in an MD, PhD program. We'll certainly, of course, look carefully at letters of recommendation and ultimately between your own, uh, your own essays and those letters, wanting to make sure that, that you understand the physician scientist career path. This is again, something that's very different from just going through medical school or just going through graduate school. And so making sure that people have some idea of what they're getting into is really important because this really is a long-term commitment and certainly wanting to understand why does it fit you in particular. The one other piece of advice I will give you for your applications, whether it's for MD, PhD programs or for medical school, is any linkage that you have personally to the program or city that you are applying to. It's not required, but if you have something there, always good to include that as well. So the physician scientist career, again, to me, it's quite interesting. And I think one of the strengths of it is that it provides you with a lot of flexibility. So when you've completed your MD and PhD training, you really have all of the options open to you. As I mentioned, and as I'll describe, I'm somebody who's gone on to do both clinical care, taking care of patients, while also doing laboratory research. And at the same time, we also see people who pick one or the other, just taking care of patients, or just doing research. 
And certainly need to keep in mind that you also have multiple different types of research open at the end of this training. Can be clinical research, can be laboratory research, or could be a research experience that really goes back and forth between the two, so-called bed to bedside research. And one of the things that's been interesting over time is when I went through my training, virtually everybody who went through MD-PhD training really went into academic positions, stayed on at their universities or went to other universities. But interestingly, what we've seen as, of, as we'll talk about is that the development of medications is really becoming more and more based on research that's done in the laboratory. And there's becoming increasing demand for physician scientists working in pharmaceutical industry to facilitate and ultimately to really translate research from something that we do in the laboratory to what we can, uh, how we can actually impact patients. And to me, one of the things that I think is most interesting about physician scientists training and careers is having that ability to not only identify important clinical problems, but then to have the ability to go and work on them. And what we've seen over time is it used to be, we always talked about going from discovering things in the lab and taking those discovery to make new treatments that we then took into the clinic. Increasingly, we're also seeing now observations in the clinic now coming back to the laboratory, sort of being reverse engineered to try to, again, study them in depth and come up for solutions for problems that we have. So I think the physician scientist career to me has, again, been really interesting, really fascinating and really fun. Um, but again, as I also mentor junior physician scientists, we talk about many of the key challenges of this career path, including focus. It's very easy, actually, to have people who are interested in everything. And in the end, you have to make sure that you can become an expert, that you're really good at what you do. And so there is a danger, and I call it here stretching yourself too thin. But the danger is, is if you actually spread yourself through thin, too thin between being a physician and being a researcher, the danger is being bad at both of them. And that's not where you want to end up being. You really wanna figure out what exactly is it you want to be outstanding at and really focus yourself to meet that goal. And then I think you're gonna run into this whether you go into graduate school, into medical school, or into MD, PhD training in any of the careers we've talked about, but work-life balance. And we can come back to talking about that at the end. So that's sort of my introduction to talking about physician science Years. And so with that as a background, let me sort of put it in a little more concrete terms by talking about my own training and my own career of what I do now uh, as a physician scientist. And so uh, like the Talking Head song said, how did I get here? So uh, I actually went for undergrad to the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, I was there for four and a half years. I did a major called Plan 2. This is a liberal arts honors program where instead of studying any one thing, you really take sort of all of these honors program and the liberal arts. And we sort of jokingly called it at that time major indecision, because instead of having to pick any one thing, you really did a little bit of everything. Um, and there were three of us in my year who not only were that broad interest in terms of the liberal arts to be in plan two, but where we also had pre-med minors. So in addition to sort of taking a spectrum of liberal arts classes, we also then took the spectrum of our pre-medical uh, uh, requirement courses. And so, you know, looking back on it, sort of reflected early on the fact that I really did have broad interest and really had an interest perhaps in going back and forth between areas that didn't necessarily talk to each other very naturally. So I graduated from the MD PhD program. I had a six month gap where I got to sort of work in the lab and not have homework, um, which was a good break before I started in the MD PhD program at the University of Texas at Houston Health Science Center. I was able to complete my MD, PhD training in seven years. So again, four years of medical school, three years of laboratory research. And just for those of you who go into this, please know that I made it through that even though I had to change labs after about six months. And it's really one of those things I would sort of reinforce. It's really important to make sure that you find the laboratory environment and project that you find really interesting an environment you feel comfortable in because it is undeniable you have to work really hard as you go through these programs. And so finding a project you like and an environment you like is really critical ultimately to being successful. I then graduated in 2001 and I did an internal medicine residency for three years up in Boston. 
Boston at Massachusetts General Hospital. So a big temperature change uh, for me and my family. I went there with my wife and at the time we had a six month old daughter. And so we were there for three years or as my wife likes to say, three winters. Uh, and then at the end of that, we came back to Houston uh, and I did the hematology oncology fellowship program at MD Anderson and then came on to the faculty in 2007 in the Department of Melanoma Medical Oncology. And so what do I do now? So one of the things that's nice, and again, as sort of an example today, is being able to participate now in education after having been a student for so many years to now be on the other side of the desk and really to help teach and mentor young trainees who are really gonna be the stars of tomorrow. And so in my role now, I actually mentor some of our junior faculty, some of our hematology oncology fellows and graduate students. Um, for our hematology oncology fellowship program, I'm actually director of research activities and I review all of the physician scientist applicants that we receive every year and interview all of those applicants personally and serve as a mentor to them after they come into our program. And as I mentioned, it's again pretty neat having been in the MD-PhD program at UT Houston before to now be on the committee to review applications and to interview applicants to the program and actually have had two MD-PhD program students in my laboratory so far. So education is definitely a component of it. Um, a second component of it that we don't talk so much about but is the administrative responsibilities. So as I mentioned, Two years ago, I became the chair of the Department of Melanoma Medical Oncology. And I would say that I now have the ability to um, really help to make sure that resources are used appropriately to make sure that our department remains successful and impactful, and particularly that we can successfully develop, again, our next generation of leaders uh, in the field. One of the other things that was unexpected and was somewhat unique to MD Anderson is, is we have what's called the MD Anderson Moonshot Program that really wanted to fund groups that would convert what we know today directly into impact on patient survival. As, as Dr. Ron DePino said when he was setting up this program, the goal was not high impact papers, but high impact on patients. And what's been really interesting over time is in co-leading this with uh, Dr. Jeff Gershenwald and then with Dr. Jennifer Wargo, is that it hasn't been about advancing my own research, but really about advancing research along the whole continuum of disease. And so for example, though as a medical oncologist, I take care of patients with the most advanced types of cancer, um, our program has actually supported research in the School of Public Health on primary prevention, including the development of curricula for preschool students to learn about the, uh, the how to do Sunday safety how to wear sunscreen, how to stay out of the sun at the peak of the day. And so something that, again, we sort of came up with age-specific programs from pre-K all the way through colleges and universities, not anything that I directly worked on, but again, really a unique opportunity to take my physician scientist training to help guide programs like this to be successful. Now, those, again, are things that I do, but I would say that still what remains near and dear to my heart in particular our laboratory research and clinical care. And so for laboratory research, I run a group of about 10 uh, lab members and I spend a lot of time going over their work and helping to develop papers and grants. Uh, my lab in particular focuses on two areas that have evolved over time. On the left, one of our key areas that we work on is what's sort of the worst of the worst in cancer, which is when cancer metastasizes to the brain. And we've really sort of had a commitment over the last decade to tackling this problem as being one of the ultimate challenges we're gonna to have to overcome to achieve true long-term survival in patients with cancer. And this fortunately is something that really has led to a lot of new insights and interestingly to new clinical trials that, that we're now in the process of either conducting or developing. And in parallel to that, the other half of my lab has really worked on the problem of therapeutic resistance. Again, as a medical oncologist, I spend most of my clinical time managing patients with advanced metastatic cancer where we need to give treatments that affect the whole body. And while we've made tremendous progress, we always find patients who don't respond or who respond initially and then develop resistance. And so my lab, like many others, tries to understand how that resistance develops and how to overcome it. And what's been really exciting over time is that these two parts of the lab 
have really become very overlapping as the unique features that we've been able to identify in brain metastases have also been many of the same features that we've identified that can cause resistance to our current treatments. And so as we've developed new strategies to overcome them, we've not only been able to use them in our models, but potentially to use them in patients with brain metastases as well. So as I said, I really love laboratory research. It really does continue to excite me. And it's again, one of the real justifications for me for having done the physician scientist pathway. And that's really balanced by the fact that I still really love taking care of patients and conducting clinical research as well. And so I've been able to develop a clinical research program where I've run clinical trials that often align with my laboratory research interests, such as clinical trials for patients with brain metastases. This is a picture on the left of a clinical trial that I led where we combined two different targeted therapies together for melanoma patients who had an activating BRAF mutation in their tumor and developed brain mets. And we combined a BRAF inhibitor and a MEK inhibitor in patients with brain metastases and showed that in almost all of the patients, the brain metastases would actually shrink. And this was really exciting, but at the same time, we showed that the duration of response was not as long as what we saw in patients without brain metastases. And again, our work that we've done on brain mets has suggested several new targets for us to go after to see if we can make these treatments work more effectively. And so that's my clinical research hat. And in parallel to that, I take care of patients as well. So again, I'm a medical oncologist at a place like MD Anderson, you can be very specialized. So I really almost exclusively see patients with metastatic melanoma. I'm in the clinic for one day a week seeing patients on Fridays. We also, again, have a melanoma medical oncology inpatient service for patients who are getting hospitalized. And I work as the attending on that service for approximately six weeks per year. And again, being related to what I work on, in the last year and a half, we've developed a brain metastasis clinic at MD Anderson that takes care of patients with brain metastasis, regardless of what tumor type they have. And so I work in there for about one day a month with several other colleagues. And so in the end, what's been so fun to me as a physician scientist is the fact that we can take our clinical observations to identify and prioritize important problems that we want to do research on. And at the same time, a lot of that new understanding that we've been developing in the laboratory is really being directly translated into the clinic to personalize and improve treatments, not just in research, but even on a day-to-day -day basis. As we now enter an era where patients often come to us with very detailed molecular profiling on their tumors and want to know how to be treated. And so it is one of the things that I find that all of the different aspects that I've uh, really been able to experience in my training over the years really comes in handy, not only in the laboratory, but even when I'm in the clinic seeing patients. And so that's sort of where, where I am. And so as I said, to me, it's a really exciting time to be a physician scientist. And in particular, I think medical oncology is a really great example of how we're really moving the ideas that we developed in the laboratory into new treatments, new progress, and as I said here, new paradigms. And so let's talk a little bit then about this, just as hopefully at the end of this two-day session to really sort of, again, hopefully support the enthusiasm you have for going into medicine in this day and age. So as a medical oncologist, again, I take care of patients with advanced cancer. And historically, the way that we took care of these patients was with chemotherapy. I don't know if you guys know this, but the, the idea of chemotherapy actually came out of chemical warfare. And so it really came out of the observation that men who'd been exposed during World War I to nitrogen mustard gas started developing terrible opportunistic infections. And this happened because the nitrogen mustard gas has essentially wiped out the normal bone marrow that makes our red cells, white cells, and platelets. And so this was sort of like full-blown AIDS uh, sitting there in the 1920s and led to a lot of research of how do you actually take care of infections in patients with non-functional immune systems. But what this also did is it gave people a clue, particularly oncologists taking care of patients with leukemia and lymphoma, cancers of white blood cells, that maybe similar chemicals could be used to actually attack cancer. And so shown to the right is Dr. Sidney Farber, for whom the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston is named, who published in 1946 the first successful treatment of cancer with chemotherapy. And it's really over the 1950s to 1980s 
that we develop most of the standard chemotherapies that we use. And again, chemotherapy, again, is truly chemical warfare. And again, it can have some success, but also can have a lot of toxicity. And so at this point, chemotherapy can be curative in some cancers, particularly childhood leukemia, Hodgkin's disease, testicular cancer, like Lance Armstrong had. Um, but in most cancers, it really can slow cancer growth um, without really curing it. And it's often associated with significant toxicities. And what's really been exciting over the last 10 to 15 years is to see that chemotherapy is being increasingly replaced by new approaches based on an improved understanding of the pathogenesis of cancer. And this is where melanoma sort of stands as a true example of the type of progress that we've been able to make. So just to give you some idea, every year about three and a half million cases of skin cancer are diagnosed here in the United States. Now, by far the most common forms of skin cancer are basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. Melanoma is actually a rare form of skin cancer. It represents less than 5% of all of those cases of skin cancer that are diagnosed, but is by far the most dangerous of the common skin cancers. So if you look every year at patients who've actually died of skin cancer, over 75% of them had a diagnosis of melanoma. And so each year here in the US, we see about 70,000 patients diagnosed with melanoma and close to 10,000 deaths. Now, <laughs> as you guys are getting ready for medical school, one of the things that you're gonna learn about in medical school are mnemonics, sort of tricks to learning different things. So one of the great ones are, what are the features that we look for in a pigmented lesion to suggest that a patient could have melanoma? We call these the ABCDEs of melanoma. And so we look for pigmented lesions that starting on the left are asymmetric, that have irregular borders, that have multiple colors, and that have a diameter greater than the eraser on a pencil. And then finally, E is a lesion that evolves or changes over time. So just in case any of you are looking at spots or wondering about the spots that you have, these are the things that make us concerned and suggest that we should now, again, I joined the Department of Melanomedical Oncology back in 2007. And at that point in time, patients with melanoma had extremely poor outcomes. This is what we called our AJCC staging system. We group patients into their extent of disease to help guide how we manage them and also to define prognosis. And so this is, again, a survival curve are alive at the beginning, but over time when this curve is dropping, that represents a patient who died of this disease. And so the blue line shows patients with stage four melanoma, and that means melanoma that had spread from the skin to distant sites in the body, and these are the patients that I take care of. And melanoma is a disease that often affects patients who are young and healthy and don't have any other problems, and strikingly in melanoma, not only was the average survival for a patient with stage is only six to eight months. But again, thinking about people who are young and healthy, the long-term survival, three-year, five-year survival rates were really in the range of five to 10%. And when I went through my training, this was one of those cancers that was on the short list of the cancers you wanted to make sure that you never got. And what's been so interesting over the last decade is how much we've learned about this cancer. First, we've been able to do DNA sequencing to understand the molecular changes that happen to drive this disease. And one of the distinguishing features of melanoma is that it has more mutations than any other common cancer. And while that in and of itself would be exciting, what we've also learned over this past decade is how the immune system plays an important role in regulating this type of cancer. And what are the things that turn an immune cell off and ways to change that so that we can activate the immune system to try to control cancer through that mechanism. And so again, when I started taking care of patients at that point, we'd never had a positive clinical trial where we showed that a medicine could improve survival in patients with stage four melanoma. So our standard of care back in 2007 was to enroll patients on a clinical trial. But between 2011 and 2020, we had 12 new treatments that were approved for patients with stage four melanoma based on large clinical trials and demonstrations of improvement in overall survival. And what's been again so remarkable is none of these new medicines are chemotherapies. They were evenly divided between immune therapies, 
that stimulate a patient's immune system to attack the cancer are targeted therapies that target specific mutations that are only present in the cancer cell and not present in the rest of the body. And so again, when I started taking care of patients, the average survival was six months. We achieved long-term survival in less than 10% of patients. And really in less than 10 years, we've now increased the median survival from less than half a year to two years, maybe three or even four years as we'll talk about. And what's really exciting is that this isn't just about slowing the cancer down. We think that we are curing now between 30 to maybe even 40% of patients with stage one lymphoma. So let's talk a little bit more about these targeted therapies and immunotherapies and what they really mean and what we've learned about them over this time. And so targeted therapy is the idea that if we can learn what actually makes a cancer cell form, what makes it grow, what makes it metastasize, that targeting those aspects of the cancer cell would be more effective than chemotherapy if we can target those things that only happen in the cancer cell, that this should also not only be just more effective, but also safer. And so this is, again, as opposed to, again, the chemical warfare that chemotherapy is, targeted therapy is trying to target things that selectively happen in cancer cells. And so over the last few decades, as we've learned about the different genetic events, the mutations, the amplifications and deletions that we find selectively in cancer cells, this identified for us new targets and led to new drugs that actually target those specific events. And so as an example, Dr. Andy Futrell is shown to the right. He and his laboratory showed that half of melanomas have an activating mutation in the BRAF gene that takes BRAF, which is a serine threonine kinase that normally can be turned on and off, turned it into something that was on all the time and activated over 200 fold. And so this is a patient that I was taking of back around 2010. And this is a PET scan up top. And so what lights up in black on a PET scan are cancer cells that are growing very aggressively. And this patient had a massive tumor that involved his right armpit and most of his chest wall. We can see here, this is a CT scan. This tumor was so big, it was pushing his lung and his heart over to the other side of we found that he had a BRAF mutation. And he was able to get on a clinical trial with the first targeted therapy we had against the BRAF gene, a medicine called bemurafenib. And after taking care of him multiple times in the hospital, because he kept getting admitted for bleeding or infections or out of control pain, after he got on this clinical trial, he came to see us six weeks later and the tumor had completely disappeared. It was again, something that he reported he started feeling better within 24 hours of starting the medicine. And so just remarkably, that tumor melted away in the process of about six weeks. And this is really the dream of targeted therapy. Can we identify again, what causes that tumor to grow? In this case, that BRAF mutation and figure out a way to block it. And really again, tremendously change patients' lives overnight. Now, while that was the promise, this is the problem. And this is what happens with many targeted therapies. So the PET scan on the left shows a patient who had widely metastatic melanoma involving multiple organs. They had a BRAF mutation. They went on a BRAF inhibitor. And after two weeks, almost all the tumors had disappeared. The dark spots that we still see here are the brain, the heart, and the lung, and the uh, bladder, which are just actually accumulating the PET dye. Um, and so the tumor had been metabolically uh, eliminated within two weeks, but unfortunately, only four months later, the tumor was back. And so we learned that with single agent BRAF inhibitors, that 90% of our patients would develop resistance within a year, and the average duration of response to these treatments was about six months. Now, people started getting biopsies of those tumors and also working in the laboratory to figure out how these tumors were becoming resistant. And what we found was that almost all of the tumors were becoming resistant because they figured out ways to get around the BRAF inhibitor and turn back on the pathway that BRAF, BRAF was activating, the ras raf kinase pathway. And so what that suggested was instead of just inhibiting BRAF, we should start targeting this pathway in multiple places, particularly things that were downstream of the BRAF gene. And so when we did that, we combined a BRAF inhibitor with a MEK inhibitor, 
And this is a waterfall plot. What each of these bars represents is the maximum change in tumor size that we saw after we started the treatment. So any bar that would go up from zero was a tumor that would grow and anything that goes down was a tumor that was shrinking. And so while chemotherapy had only a 10% response rate, this had a 95% chance of making the tumor stop growing or shrink. And interestingly, combining BRAF and MEK inhibitors was less toxic than either one alone, and the responses lasted much longer, such that we now had five-year overall survival rates of almost 35%. Now, this was a big step forward, but again, we still see that in most patients, these responses will stop at some point. And that's why it's been so exciting in parallel to our targeted therapy work to have our immunotherapy work. And so immunotherapy, again, the immune system is set up as a defense against things that shouldn't be there. And historically, we thought about this as foreign things like viruses and bacteria, but there's really a lot of evidence that cancer is something that the immune system can also recognize and attack. And so the goal became, how can we harness the body's defenses, the immune system, to attack cancer. And sort of with the same way that when we get vaccinated, we're not just looking for a short-term effect, but for our immune system to learn and remember how to attack the cancer would give us the chance for long-term disease control and even cure. One of the things though that's uh, the challenge to all of this is that while our body again likes a very active immune system to fight infections, if the immune system gets overactive, it can cause many problems like rheumatoid arthritis, ulcerative colitis, many of diseases. And so the body has set up many defenses to keep the immune system under control. So in 2018, Dr. Jim Allison and Dr. Tesaku Honjo won the Nobel Prize for Medicine for their groundbreaking work where they identified what some of those breaks were on the immune system that normally dampen the immune response and the demonstration that if we could block those breaks or disinhibit the immune system, we could stimulate the immune system to attack cancer, most famously with anti-PD-1 antibodies that are now FDA approved in many different types of cancer. And so again, coming back to patients, this is a CT scan from a patient I met who was 87 years old and he had metastatic melanoma. He had lumps and bumps all over his body this upper CT scan shows a large lymph node that he felt in his armpit. And he also had multiple sites of disease in his liver. And in the old days, we simply would have referred this patient for hospice because our chemotherapies we knew wouldn't have stopped this cancer. And they also would have had terrible side effects. So we started this patient on single agent anti-PD-1 immunotherapy in April of 2015. We actually only treated him uh, until December of that year, so really only about seven months, and the patient had no side effects whatsoever. And although usually we think that cancer treatments have to make you sick to work, this is the CT scan after only three months of treatment. That enlarged lymph node that was in the armpit had completely disappeared, as had all of the spots in his liver. And what's so exciting is that although I only treated the patient with immunotherapy for seven months, now, more than six years later, he still has no evidence of cancer because we were able to stimulate his immune system to be able to fight the cancer for us. We didn't have to keep giving him medicine. And this is the dream, to get long-term cures with treatments that don't have toxicity. And so where do we stand right now? So this is, we had our annual meeting of the annual Society for Clin American Society for Clinical Oncology in June and we saw updated results from a large clinical trial in patients with stage four melanoma. So again, just to remember back when we started the overall survival on average for a melanoma patient with stage four disease was six months. In this clinical trial with anti-CTLA-4 antibodies, the five-year survival rate was 25%. With anti-PD-1, it was 44%. And combining those two immune therapies together it was over 50%. And we think that by, for the patients who've made it five years, the likelihood is that they've actually been cured of cancer. So we've gone from curing five to 10% to over 50% of patients in a relatively short period of time, but we still need to do better. And one of the interesting things about this is we also have a whole new field now, because although these more aggressive immune therapies are working well, they're also causing many different side effects from the immune system attacking the body. And so now, we are working with our colleagues in rheumatology
to figure out how to make our immune therapies not only more effective, but also safer. So again, to me, it's been sort of a really exciting time, and that's why it's so fun to be able to talk to you today, not only about medical oncology, but also about the physician scientist career path and really the healthcare training and, and career pathway overall. So what have I learned over the years? So as I said, and hopefully I was able to convey to you, to me, it's really an incredibly exciting time to start a career in medical sciences. We're seeing multiple breakthroughs in the understanding of disease and increasingly rapid translation of this into new treatments. And overall, I would say from my perspective, we actually need outstanding physicians, we need outstanding researchers, and we need outstanding physician scientists. We really have shortages in all three of those areas. And so in terms specifically of the physician scientist training and career, for me, I think that this is a great pathway for people who really are excited about bridging that gap between what we do in the laboratory and what we do in the clinic. And that again, those arrows go in both directions. At the same time, I'll tell you, it's a very challenging career path. It's really important to make sure that it's what you want to do. And I would say that I would recommend preparing for this by trying to get both clinical and laboratory experiences to say, do I really need both of these when I wake up every day? And certainly if you can, to get to know physician scientists, talk to them about what their experience is, what their life is, to see if this is something that it, you would actually wanna do and if it's the right fit for you. In terms of next steps, again, I think we really need bright people in all different areas. And what's most important as you go through this process of doing your applications is figuring out what is the right path for you. Ultimately, that's a combination of what excites you and honestly, what is it that you're good at? Because we'll always enjoy the things that we're good at more than the things that we're not good at. And it's the way we'll have the most impact. One of the things that I got from my mentors along the way, particularly after I got to the job, but I think it's always good to do is thinking strategically. What do I wanna be doing in five to 10 years? What do I need to do now in order to get there? And in particular, I think, can you identify people who are doing what you wanna do and talk to them about how did they get there? And finally, the other thing I will say is, is that a key to all of this is life work balance. In all of these careers, again, although the work is exciting, it certainly, again, can't be one's whole life. You want to really sort of be able to have that balance and it really should be possible to do and it really makes it all very worthwhile and very fun if you can work hard when you're at work, but also then play hard when you're at home and with your family. And so these are some of the nice trips. My daughter uh, is actually at Ohio State, so we do OHIO pictures wherever we go. Um, so with that, again, to me, it's a really fascinating time to go into any of these careers. And I hope this gives you some idea about what MD-PhD training is, what the physician scientist career path is, and maybe even gotten some of you excited about the possibilities of medical oncology. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you guys might have. Thank you, Dr. Davis. That was such an interesting and informative presentation. Um, our first question is to prevent the progression of cancer can immunotherapy and targeted therapy be used? So that's a really great question. So you're right, the way that we've often done things in oncology is first testing them in our most advanced patients, the patients with stage four disease. And if they work there, then going back earlier to say, well, for our patients, so, so stage three cancer means cancer has spread, but only to things that are nearby, we can still remove it by surgery but we know there's a high risk of it coming back. And so to your point, we did clinical trials first of targeted therapy and then of immune therapy after patients underwent surgery to ask if we could reduce the chance of cancer coming back. And in both of those trials, the answer was yes. And so we now use targeted therapy and immunotherapy and melanoma, not only in stage four, but also in stage three. And now we're even testing it in patients with stage two disease. The other thing for any of you who happen to be interested in immunology, there's pretty good evidence that immunotherapy works better when there's cancer, more cancer there to recognize. So increasingly what we've done with patients who need to undergo surgery, um, patients with stage three cancer, we actually do immunotherapy first and then do surgery. 
So we have shown in the laboratory that this gives us a better chance of generating an immune response against the cancer. What it also does is when we do the surgery is we can tell if the treatment is working or not. And so if it's working, we know this is a good thing to continue. If it's not working, one, it means we need to switch to something else. But two, we also then take that tumor back to the laboratory and now can really study a patient's tumor to ask why did the treatment not work? And so it's been a way for us to learn how to make our current therapies work even better. So it's again, one of those things of going from the clinic to the bench now, when we take those tumors from patients who haven't responded back to the laboratory. Right, thank you. Um, our next question is, how did you balance work and life in an MD PhD program? Yeah, so that's a really great question. And I will tell you, um, it was not only a question during MD PhD program, but continuing on to this very day, um, you know, as we're sitting here doing this conference on a Sunday. Um, you know, I think the important thing is, is that I hopefully I sort of conveyed the fact um, the work really excites me. I find it really interesting. And in some ways, it's hard to stop thinking about it. Um, but what I've learned over time is it's really important when you leave work and you're with your significant other or you're with your friends, your brain needs to shift its focus to what you're doing at that point in time. It can't always be sort of running those experiments in the back of your head and being really conscious about enjoying the time that you have away from the lab with your friends is really important. And so I think the, the best advice I can give you is just be really conscious about where you are and who you're with and what you're thinking about. Really try to focus, you know, when you're in the laboratory or when you're studying, focus on that. But when you set aside time to do other things, make sure you, you dedicate yourself to that as much as well. Not only will it make it more enjoyable for you, it'll make it more enjoyable for everybody you're with. And so I think it's, it continues to be a challenge, but it also, again, is, is one of the most important things you can do, whether it's in your training or later on, no matter which one of these fields you go on to work with. Definitely, thank you. Our next question is, what would you say is the most interesting case you've had as an oncologist? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it's, it's hard to say, you know, um, I've got so many patients who've been interesting to me. I had a patient who the first time I met him, the patient was in the hospital. Um, he had been admitted with cancer that was sort of widespread throughout his body. Nobody knew what it was, but he had multiple tumors in his brain. Um, and uh, they did a biopsy. They started him on radiation. And every day he was getting sicker and sicker and sicker, got to the point where he was just confused all the time. And then the biopsy came back that it was melanoma. And then we tested very quickly, found it had a BRAF mutation. We started him on the targeted therapy. And within 24 hours, he was suddenly awake and alert. And we stopped the radiation. We shrunk his tumors very effectively, but we knew that the track record for targeted therapy was that although it would work in almost everybody up front, at some point it would stop. And so we then switched him from targeted therapy to immune therapy. And the immune therapy worked in one of the interesting parts was all of the side effects he had. So he came in one day telling me that he was an X-Men because all of his eyebrows and uh, eyelashes had all turned white. Um, because melanoma uh, is from melanocytes that make melanin. And so when the immune system starts recognizing the tumors, it also starts recognizing things that make pigment. So one of the things that we often see as a side effect, but a good sign is patients developing vitiligo. Um, but uh, it was one of those things where simply the color of his hair changed everywhere. And uh, he, he did well, unfortunately, at one point in time, his immune therapy stopped working and we showed that the targeted therapy could work again. Um, and it was one of those things that it was, again, he, he really did have a terrible cancer um, and eventually lost his life to it. But, you know, not only did these treatments work and give him time, but they gave him great quality of life. Um, and it's people like that, that we are again, happy about the progress we've made, but where we realize how much more we have to do and how much better we have to do. And, I have sort of like a whole series of patients that have taught me lessons like that. It's hard to ever pick one patient that you found the most, in, most interesting and most exciting, but there's really fortunately for me at this point, many of those types of patients. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, our next question is, in consideration of the competitiveness of this field, 
What advice do you have for those considering an MD-PhD program? So I think the most important thing for applying for MD-PhD programs is really having a meaningful research experience. Um, and so having the chance to work on a project and, you know, again, and I will say that my first research experience is I was just doing what I was instructed to do. Um, it's really only you after you've been able to work on a project for multiple months that you often sort of feel comfortable taking more ownership of your projects. Um, that, though, is exactly what we look for in the applicants. Um, this idea of somebody who wasn't just along the, for the ride, who wasn't just being told what to do, but was really thinking about it. So I encourage you as you're doing your research, do the reading, do the studying, learn about why you're doing the technique you're doing, what are other techniques that you can do. Honestly, I have to say what's interesting about your generation is how many people I see that are taking like a year off between undergrad and college to give themselves more time to experience things. And I think for MD PhDs, it's a really great chance not to have to study all the time, but to be able to work full time on research um, is something that, you know, we clearly see people come out of that experience really having decided if they like research or not, and really often having had a chance to decide if, if they're good at this and, and are they motivated to really sort of take ownership of a project. So um, I think that the key part, it's, it's again, at your stage in your careers, it's hard to expect people to have first author papers. But really what I'm just very interested in hearing is, did you think about your project? Did you understand it? Did you troubleshoot some problems? And those, those are the things that really illustrate somebody who's interested in and probably this is the career path that they really need to be. Thank you. So with respect to time, this will be our last question. What are some of the challenges that you faced in getting patients to enroll in clinical trials? And how have you handled them? Yeah, so lots of, of challenges there. And I see particularly the question about underrepresented groups. And so we'll talk about sort of the two different issues. So one of the things that we have to acknowledge whenever a patient goes on to a clinical trial is they always want to ask us, well, how effective is this? Um, and the reality is, is a clinical trial means that we're testing something that we don't know how well it works. Um, at least for most of the things, if we're testing a new treatment, we are hoping that this will be really good but we just don't know. And one of the ways that we talk to patients about that is I talked to you about how we have now the BRAF inhibitors, the MEK inhibitors, the anti-PD-1s. At one time, those were treatments we were giving in clinical trials where we were hoping that they would, again, help patients. And it turns out those patients who participated in those clinical trials got the medicines that are now the standard of care a couple years before other people did. And that's what we're always hoping for our patients, that they're going to get what's better. Um, you know, certainly when trials are comparing the standard of care versus experimental therapy, we're really, again, dependent on patients being willing to sort of, again, be randomized between those two things. And I think all we can do is really explain this is how we got to where we are. And we certainly try to design our trials so that if a treatment isn't working, the patient is able to switch to the other treatment. And then finally, talking about patients for underrepresented groups, I think, again, throughout all of medicine, we recognize that that's a huge problem. And I will say part of, part of the issue goes back to historically, we know that there were types of research that were done that were completely unethical. And how do we establish trust with patients to really make sure that they feel comfortable with the experimental treatments that we're offering them? I think one of the biggest things to do is to really acknowledge what are the fears that people have, what are the concerns that people have, and acknowledge that you understand that. And that you know, whenever we treat patients on a clinical trial, it's always up to the patient whether they want to continue the treatment or not. They really are in control. Um, and making sure that patients understand that and make sure we're here to work with them as partners and as a team to get the best possible outcome we can for them is I think one of the things that's really important for us always to strive to communicate with our patients. Definitely. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Davis, for joining us today for the last session of our conference. It was really great to hear from you. And thank you to all of our participants for joining us as well. I have put Dr. Davis's faculty link in the chat along with our website and our link tree so you can connect with us on our social media. 
Um, all of our virtual shadowing quizzes will close on this Sunday, the 25th at 11.59 uh, Central Time. The quiz for this session is currently open under our conference page on the website, which I also linked in the chat. And all session recordings will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel, which is the pre-med scene, um, shortly after the session is complete. Um, if you have any questions about the conference um, or anything at all, please feel free to post them in the chat and we will get to you. Um, Dr. Davis has also listed his email in the chat, so you can reach out to him if needed. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Davis.